Well, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Springfield. It is good to see you. Good to hear the buzz in the room. Good to have seen so many of you in the Bible study time that was before this and to know that you're interacting with each other, that you're pushing each other on to love God, to live for Him, doing so in practical ways and supporting and encouraging one another in that time. For those of you not in Bible study class this morning, let me encourage you next week. Be here an hour earlier than now or so. Be here about 9.15 and get involved in a class. Get involved in a class where people can encourage you and where you can encourage and interact with them. I think that's an important part and a valuable discipline for us all to be involved in interacting with others who can encourage us in the things of the Lord. If you're a guest with us today, thanks for being here. If you're watching online this morning, thanks for watching with us, whether it's live or whether it's later. We pray that this will be a time that allows you to connect with God, with His desires for how you interact with Him and how you do so, also interacting with others. That's a big part of Romans chapter 14 through 16, is it's not about us and us alone, but it's about us and our interactions with others for the purpose of the gospel. This morning, we're going to rise, we're going to stand, we're going to sing. And as we do so, let me ask you to turn your attention to the Lord, that he might work in you and then later work through you throughout the week. Let's rise and sing.
we do ask you to be glorified today. We humble ourselves before you, Father, that you might be glorified. You're an amazing God. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do, all that you are, all the ways, Lord, that you reveal yourself to us. We thank you today, especially that we can come together to hear from you, to hear from you in the songs that we sing, to hear from you in the word that is written and spoken. And especially, Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming together with our brothers and sisters, that we might be encouraged and exhorted, that we might see the love of Christ in our brothers and sisters' face, in their demeanor, in their smile, that we might be brought closer to you, Father, by the time that we spend together with one another in this place. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the blessings that you give us. We are tempted sometimes, Lord, to pray that all of our needs will be met. You see the needs of this congregation, Father, there are many. You see our hearts and the burdens that we have for people and for situations and circumstances. And today, Father, we realize that not all of the things that we ask uh, are to be fixed just like magic. But Lord, there are some things that we need to face and some things that we need to deal with. And we ask, Lord, that you would grant us that sense of your presence and that awareness of your power to know, Lord, that no matter what it is that we face, you are able, you are our shepherd. You are the one who will guide us through and provide us the strength that we need at every moment of the day so that Jesus Christ is praised because of the problems that we have faced. We thank you, Father. We ask that you would help us to respond appropriately and to show Jesus Christ in our lives. We pray, Father, during this week of prayer for international missions, for the gospel it goes, as it goes out around the world. You see so many places, Father, where people are needy, where people are hurting, where people need to hear the name of Jesus. Maybe even for the very first time, so many unreached people groups, Lord, around this world. And so we ask, God, that you would be pleased to use your servants in so many different ways, whether it be electronically and the, the TV and the radio, whether it's personal interaction, so many different ways, Lord, that you want to share the good news of Jesus Christ today through your people. We ask that you would do it in strength and in power and that people would be brought to Jesus Christ this very day. We love you and we praise you, we honor you, and we ask that in this service we would hear from you and as we leave this place, that we would be changed and we would reflect you in new and different ways. And for that, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
Church, uh, just to let you know, I'm the deacon of the week. If anything, anything, anything we can do for you, we're here. We can pray, we can have a moment together in case of something, any struggle, we're here to serve 24 7. So the information is right here and the abolition. Okay, we're going to pray for the offering. Lord, te damos las gracias por este momento que tú me das. Y perdón por mis hermanos si lo estoy haciendo en español. Mi corazón lo siente así. Te estoy agradecido. I'm so thankful because you are there for us. So I'm going to ask you, you know, multiply this offering so we can reach those people that never know you. Cover our needs. Multiplied each dollar according to your desire. In the name of Jesus, oramos. Amen.
friend we do have in Jesus. Boys and girls, you are dismissed to Children's Church. Thank you, Chris and Praise Team and Miss Peggy for pointing us to the Lord. Thank you all for checking on and continuing to pray for Pastor Sam. He should be returning with us in the near future. Continue to pray for him and his brother and his family as they grieve and as they work through and process through all the many details that follow the loss of a loved one. For the next three weeks, we're going to walk through Paul's instructions for the Roman church on how to get along with people that you don't agree with. It's easy to get along with people you agree with, but sometimes it's hard when you don't agree on really important things like cats and dogs. Okay? So we're going to talk about and give some very practical application for the next couple of weeks on how to get along about cats and dogs. Um, and how to do so on even more important things, actually, in the life of a church and how the getting along in a church is important. Now, in my house, we have four kids in our home. They are growing, maturing, and as they do so, their love for one another grows, and it's expressed in different ways. You know, with four kids in our house, sometimes it's amazing to see how much brothers and sisters can love each other. And it's sweet, and it's awesome. And other times, it's totally baffling and amazing at how brothers and sisters can fight with each other and argue with each other about really unimportant stuff. You know, sometimes I wonder if they love each other or if they love to fight with each other. Maybe you have a sibling or multiple siblings in your home that is very similar. I was talking with my grandmother over Christmas, and she was talking about getting along and at other times not getting along, both as a teenager and as a senior adult with their siblings. You know, sometimes I think the same thing might be true in church. There's nobody that we can love like a brother or sister in Christ, but there's also sometimes nobody we'd rather fight with than a brother or sister in Christ. And Paul looks at the Roman church and he says, get along. Stop fighting about things that don't matter. It's okay to sharpen each other. It's okay to have dialogue and discussion, but you've got to get along in Christ. The church at Rome struggled with this, so Paul gives them directions. Now, As we walk through these next three weeks on this section of Romans chapter 14 and the beginning of 15, where Paul talks about getting along in the church, I want to remind you Paul is not telling them to tolerate sin. He is not saying sin is okay or it's okay to get the gospel wrong. He gives them non-essentials and talks to them about things that are not blatantly sinful, but can be sin in the way that they interact with each other about. Okay? So it's important that nobody listening now, online, those in the room, or later, recognize and walk through this thing and say, hey, it doesn't matter. People in the church should not care about sin. We should just all get along and let other people do their sinful thing. Paul has written already in Romans chapter 6 about the incompatibility, how it should be incompatible compatible with the believer to walk in a lifestyle of sin, having the Holy Spirit inside us. We should live out God's holiness that he puts in us. So he is not talking about dealing with sin and not disagreeing on that. He's saying, hey, listen, on sin, deal with it. Push each other on. Love God. Live for him. Don't allow sin to linger. But non-essentials are non-essential. If you've got your Bible, Romans chapter 14, if you're using the Pew Bible, it begins on page 1127. If you're 12 or older or don't have a Bible at home and a translation you can read or understand, be our guest. Take that copy of the Bible, consider it our gift to you, read and follow along with us. If you don't know where to read, there's a section in your bulletin that follows the full plan that's on the blue paper out in the foyer that allows us and pushes us to read through the entire Bible in a year. Some of you have never done that. You've never read through the entire Bible. Why not do it this year? Doing along with us, it's not too late to get started now. All right, we're going to finish out Romans in February. 
We were last in it in November in Romans 12 and 13. Paul has talked to them about how to be living transformed lives, living out the theology of the first 11 chapters. And he still drops in and reminds us of the theology that is to be lived out here in Romans chapter 14. Chapter 13 called upon us to honor God's sovereignty through the authorities he's put over our lives. And it ended by showing us how to live in light of the eternal future we have with God or absent from God's blessing and presence for eternity. Follow along as I read through Romans 14. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is for his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Chapter 14 begins and we get a chapter and a half or so coming up on how to get along. You know, coming into this study in Romans, and we've been off and on in Romans now for almost two years, I thought Romans was about theology and almost only theology, okay? I thought it was high doctrine. I thought it was doctrine and and all of this meat around the doctrine. And I have been shocked studying through Romans in context, working through commentaries, preaching through it with you, how much of the book of Romans is about the need of the church there to get along. To get along and understand where their Jewish brothers are coming from and their Gentile sisters are coming from and the way that the Bible works together on behalf of God, for God's glory on behalf of all of God's people. I've been shocked by just how much of Romans is for problems that they were encountering at the church at Rome. It's one of those amazing things that happens when we study and break down God's word and immerse ourselves in it. We see that there's so much more there than we might remember being there or think of as being there but you know the church at rome was not alone multiple churches in the new testament had to be told to get along get along get along get along on non-essentials so much so that in paul's letter to the philippians this whole letter about joy paul actually calls out two individual believers for all time in the bible for needing to get along I mean, you think it'd be bad if I called you out from the pulpit and said, Pastor Jacob needs to grow up in this way? Like, that would be bad. But imagine that Paul wrote your name in with one other person. Like, this was an age when you singled out people, okay, for all time. Like, they will be too famous. Euodia and Syntyche will be famous in heaven for all the wrong reasons, okay? Get along, get along, get along. And churches since then have had struggles in getting along. Our church is better than many that I hear about in terms of unity. We're better at unity. But are there some ways that we can grow in getting along on non-essentials? Absolutely. And I think it's valuable that we see each other on non-essentials in light of the essentials of the gospel and what Paul's going to walk us through in Romans chapter 14 and 15, okay? Boys and girls, taking notes on your note sheet today. Paul's gonna tell them to, they're weak in faith. The ones that are weak in faith, welcome them, 
Don't fight with them. So boys and girls, in box one, I want you to draw somebody really, really strong hugging someone really, really weak. And me and you are going to have a problem if you draw my face on the one that's really weak and Pastor Jacob on the one that's really strong. Okay? You need somebody really strong like me, all right, and hugging somebody really weak. Okay? Because Paul tells them to welcome one another. Don't fight each other. We are to welcome one another, the weak and the strong, getting along. We should welcome those that have different opinions about non-essential stuff. And a lot of stuff is non-essential. This isn't a welcome, come here, let me give you a hug and now show you how you're wrong. Welcome either. Hey, Welcome people, don't war with them. We should be more prone to welcome other believers than to war with them. This is about getting along with other believers. We shouldn't war with non-believers, by the way. We should be welcoming non-believers, pointing them to Jesus. But here the concept of welcome is welcome. I don't have to show you that you have a difference. I don't have to show you that you're wrong because this is a difference of opinion on non-essential stuff. We should welcome unbelievers and point them to Jesus and the gospel, not backing away from what God says about sin and the gospel. But we should welcome believers, not warring with them at all, because the the battle that we all have is not against each other, is at war with God apart from Christ. We are at war with God, and we have peace with God in Christ as we've walked through in Romans, so we ought to have peace with one another. We should welcome one another instead of warring. But all too often, churches and individual Christians have been busy warring over non-essentials instead of welcoming other believers who disagree even on stuff that we might call important. All too often, we've actually taken things that aren't essential and we've called them sin issues. Not everything is a sin issue. Okay? You can be wrong about cats being awesome, and that's not a sin issue. Okay? It's not a sin issue if you like cats or dogs or whatever. Okay? That's a joking thing with me and the cats and the dogs. But listen, if we were to really like, have First Baptist Church of Cats and First Baptist Church of Dogs, we'd have a problem. And all too often, there's been First Baptist Church that had the green carpet and Second Baptist Church that wanted the red carpet. Because the red reminds us of the blood of Christ. So therefore, it would be a sin issue to have green carpet instead of red carpet. Well, obviously, our church doesn't believe that since we have green carpet. Okay? All too often, the color of the carpet has become a sin issue. And I'll tell you, it can become a sin issue when churches choose to make that something to fight over. But it's not a color of the carpet on its own. It's not a sin issue. All too often... That has happened. And we can look back and we can tell stories of other churches. Many of you recall me telling you of my growing up, even even though I'm not that old, contrary to my kids' belief, that like the church culture I grew up in, like you didn't go to the movies because that was almost certainly sinful. Because it would be sinful if somebody else thought you were seeing a bad movie. And a bad movie would be anything that, you know, basically any movie for that matter, okay? All right, I told you about my great uncle that was a pastor that loved to play cards, but, and he liked to play the game of Rook, but he had to close the blinds before so nobody else could see him playing Rook because they might think that he was gambling and that would be a bad thing. So I had to do that. Other Christians in recent decades, they've warred over all types of things. Cosmetics. They've warred over playing cards. They've warred over different views on alcohol, tobacco. They've warred over fashion, and I don't just mean immodesty, but even looking when it can be appropriate, looking like culture would look, because that wouldn't be being different from the world. They've warred over different Bible translations being used. They've warred over sports, whether or not people can play them and enjoy them. Can you watch on Sunday? Can you not watch on Sunday music? Can you even have drums? You know, I, I'm reminded of the old stories that, you know, like when a lot of hymns were introduced, they were old bar tunes and, you know, problems like that, that story being told. So listen, people have fought, Christians have fought over a lot of stuff. This week, if you read much on Romans 14, there's a story of Charles Spurgeon, the famous prince of preachers in London, and him and another pastor getting into a battle with each other. Spurgeon thought the other guy was immoral because he enjoyed theater. The other guy thought Spurgeon was immoral because he smoked cigars regularly. A lady at one point supposedly came up to Spurgeon and said, listen, you're you're smoking cigars is not a way to honor God. And, And he says, oh, I don't do it in excess. And she says, what do you mean by excess? He says, I never smoke more than two at a time. different time, different culture, and at this point, knowing what we know, 
That's probably not a good way to honor God with your body, particularly no more than two at a time. Honor God with your body. Honor God with what you do. But don't be busy fighting other believers. Like, there's a lot of good things that we know. Spurgeon for the other guy, I had never really heard of him. So now my, in my brain, it's him, it's like, hey, you and Syntyche need to get along in Philippians, and these two guys need to get along on theater and cigars. Okay. There's still significant discussion in Christian camps, in many Christian camps, about the role of the Sabbath. And what does rest on the Sabbath look like? I try to convince my kids it means take a nap on Sunday. They don't always comply, so... Okay, there, there's disagreement on what we can or can't do. What day is the Sabbath? How do we honor God through that? I want to remind you, being stricter than the Bible is, is not a definition of holiness. Following the Bible and what Christ teaches us and what the Spirit leads us is a mark of holiness. But being stricter than the Bible is not how we ought to define holiness. Holiness should not be in the absence only of what we do, but also in what we do. James 1 talks about sins of omission and sins of commission. Okay? We shouldn't be warring with other non-believers about non-essentials. So we work through the chapter. In the beginning of chapter 15, it's going to be unclear all of the issues they were talking about. We get a little bit of a background here, but we don't get all the issues. But we can know from how Paul responds here versus how he responds elsewhere in his letters that what they're dealing with is not issues related to the gospel because Paul clearly calls out violations of the gospel and rebukes that. And it's not issues of sin because he also speaks later about sin totally differently than the way that he deals with the issues here in chapter 14 and the beginning of 15. And we have to remember that not every issue with other believers is a sin issue. We should treat differences of opinion with love and grace. Now, in verse 2, we begin seeing the differences. One of the differences they had was dietary. Verse 2 talks about one believes he can eat anything, the, uh, the weak person eats only vegetables. Okay, so one person was on the seafood diet. If I see it, I eat it. The other one was not. They were on the vegetable plan. They were on the vegetarian thing, okay? And th who knows what they were citing? It's unclear exactly why that they, with a weaker conscience, felt that it was important that they honored God by going on the vegetarian plan. It's unclear why. It's likely that it's similar to the issue in Corinth, where Paul deals with and expands on this, where many of the meats had been sacrificed first in the pagan temple as a part of the sacrificial system and then were sold later. So maybe they and their weak conscience could not distinguish between the worship of idolatry through eating that meat and the worship of the Lord. And Paul looks at him and says, this isn't essential. Okay. By the way, when, it, when he talks about some that are weak here, he's talking about weak in conscience, not weak physically. So boys and girls, you are not allowed from Romans 14 to turn to your parents and tell them that if they make you eat vegetables, you will be weak. Okay? I know how your brains think. I know that you found this verse in the Bible that says the one that believes the weak person eats only vegetables and you want to tell your parents that if you eat vegetables, you're going to be weak and you want to be big and strong like me. But the laughter from the front pew where my children sit. You cannot turn to your parents and say, eating only your vegetables makes you weak. Your parents could come back to you and say, well, remember what happened with Daniel and his buddies and when they ate only vegetables and they were big and strong? So if you try it with your parents, they're going to come back at you and you might end up on the vegetable-only diet, which would grow you spiritually by helping you develop discipline and patience and perseverance possibly, okay? Paul looks at him and says, this is a matter of conscience. A weak conscience, not a weak conscience and your faith that needs to grow, but a weak conscience displayed in this particular way. So, Christian brothers and sisters that were okay with eating the meat that might have possibly been sacrificed to a pagan god, go for it. But those that eat only veggies, don't make it hard for them either. Don't make it hard for each other. 
to follow the Lord and exercise your Christian liberty and conscience. Paul does take sides on this issue. He calls one a weaker conscience and another differently. But he doesn't tell them that they have got to improve each other. He leaves this as a matter of personal conviction and doesn't treat it as a sin issue. They are to welcome each other because God has welcomed the vegetarian and the one that uses vegetables as a garnish for their meat. Okay? He welcomes, God welcomes both. So boys and girls, we ought to accept those that God accepts, which means in box two, I want you to draw a cross, and then on one side of the cross, I want you to draw some vegetables. And on the other side, I need you to draw a burger or a steak or some chicken tenders. And showing here that in the cross, those that are vegetarians and those that are carnivores and carnivores only can get along in the cross. What God has accepted, both individuals, both groups, ought to accept each other. What we have in common in the cross is more important than what we have different. So this is your opportunity to do your best veggie tales thing, okay, with the cross uniting both. Starting in verse 4. Taking notes, we have the reminder that Christ is the master of all. And all I use there, at first I was trying to make it more specific, and then I realized, no, he's the master of all believers, and he's the master of all in a believer's life. Every area of all believers reports to Jesus, and he is the master of all. If you want to look through verses 4 through 9 and see the number of times that the lordship of Christ, the mastery of Christ is referenced, you're going to find it repeated time after time after time after time, that he is the master of those that eat meat or don't eat meat. He is the master of those that honor God and try to honor him by celebrating certain days in certain ways. And those that do other days in different ways. He's the master that we report to. And we're going to talk more about that in verses 10 through 12 in a few minutes. And it is him, the master, Christ, the Lord, who is master. And he upholds and sustains us according to the end of verse 4. He will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. It's not our eating of meat or not eating meat. It's not our celebration of the Sabbath in a particular way or our appreciation of certain types of songs. It's not our views on a certain color of the carpet and getting that right or getting it wrong. It's not our views on any non-essential matter that sustains us in Christ. And it's not even our obedience that sustains us in Christ. It is God's power that upholds us. The same grace that saves us sustains us. We are not sustained by our walking with God and getting the non-essentials right. He is our master in every area. He sustains us. So when we get to verse 5, the discussion of the days and how they were to be celebrated, Paul says, here, just be fully convinced. Just know what you believe. Don't not think about it. Think about it. Pray through it. And do as God leads. You can discuss with others, but you don't need to fight with each other. By the way, on the days thing, he doesn't here call one position weak or strong. Right? Verse 6, he reminds us that we observe in the honor of the Lord. We observe in honor of the Lord. We do so when eating, eating in honor of the Lord and giving thanks to God. We do so when not doing so in honor and giving thanks to God. What's important here is that you're giving thanks to God for the cross and for his provision, and that you're finding joy and delight in him, whether your diet is one of broccoli, carrots, beans, and onions, or whether you're on the carnivore plan and thanking God that in Christ they could have bacon and ham, okay, which was a big deal. That was a change for them. Okay? So each time that you enjoy that bacon, be thankful that you live on this side of the cross and not in the Old Testament Jewish law. Be thankful and honor God in what you do in non-essentials. Verse 7, we get the reminder that we're not our own master. None of us lives to ourselves. We report to God in Christ. If we die, we die to the Lord. If we live, we live for the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. He is our master. We're not each other's masters. Verse 7, we have that reminder that we're not our own. We belong to Christ. We live in a world where he is sovereign 
and in charge of both the timing and the means of a person's life and death, and both of those things are unto the Lord. So whether you live, live unto the Lord. When you die, die for the Lord's glory by suffering well, trusting into Christ that he is the master and that all things can, will be made well in eternity. Live or die for God's glory. Paul looks in Philippians 1 and he says, whether I live or die, it's joy in Christ. Whether living or dying, we belong to the Lord. He's in charge of all we do. So Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, to whether to eat or drink, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In a similar context, much expanded on the issues of meat and other things in the church in Corinth on non-essentials. Christ lived and he died. He rose from the dead, according to verse 9. And because of his death and resurrection, he is master over all areas of all lives of believers. He's not Lord over part, he is Lord over all. You know, as a kid, sometimes when somebody was being bossy, we would use the phrase, who died and left you in charge? Well, Paul says, Jesus died and he rose again, so you're not in charge. Okay? It's not that Jesus died, so you're in charge. No, Jesus died and rose again, so he's really in charge. Okay? Jesus died and rose again, so he's really in charge and master of all. So whether eating or drinking, celebrating certain days in certain ways, or working through any number of other non-essential things, we need to remember Christ is our master, and we're not in charge of others. So though we do encourage each other, we do help each other on matters of sin and we can discuss with each other matters of non-essential things and opinion you really don't report to each other on what whether you're on the seafood diet or any other version of the diet we really don't report to each other on whether or not you watch disney movies or whether you boycotted the right company at the right time we really don't report to each other on whether or not you dance or whether or not you have the same views on Christian nationalism or how Christians ought to be engaged in social justice and what that even means. We really don't report to each other on that because they're not, with Christ is the master of all. And most of those things are not sin issues. Now we can be sinful in how we engage in them and how we think about others on them. But we all bow before the cross. He is the master of all. So boys and girls in box three. I want you to draw a bunch of people, like fill that box up with people and put a cross in it. And I want all of those people bowing down because we don't bow before each other. We bow before Christ, the master. He is the master of all. Building upon that idea in verse 10 through 12, we've got the concepts that we report to God for what we do. It is God that we give an account to, not to others. Similarly, we give an account to God, not to others. It's God that's the judge of us. And to cl clarify, this judge concept here is not punishment for our sin, because as Paul has already said in Romans, Jesus took the eternal punishment for all of our sin, past, present, future. This is similar to what Paul would describe in 1 Corinthians 3, about the, what we do with our time, our talent, and our treasures in our Christian life, that we give an account to God for how we use what has been entrusted to us for his glory. This is not the concept of eternal punishment. So, but as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 9, we ought to run like we're trying to receive a prize and discipline our body that we might honor God in all that we do, taking life seriously, giving an account for all that has been entrusted to us, giving an account of our time, our talent, and our money, in addition to how we exercise Christian freedom. So boys and girls, box four. You might still be filling up box three, but here's box four. I want you to draw a clock. A dollar sign or some money and a trophy. And I want you to put, draw a person putting them down before the cross, showing that we give an account to God for our time, for our money, and for our trophies or our treasures, our talents, trophies, and treasures. Christ is master over every area of our life, and we give an account to him. Let's remember that truth. Now, it's an account that we give to God. So that can set you free from the crippling pressure of giving an account to others and trying to keep up with everyone else. 
You don't have to dress or act or have a home in a certain way to please others. You know, my kids recently taught me a new word, okay? They taught me a new word. It's called drippy. And Pastor Ron, just so you know, being drippy doesn't mean that like you're sweating profusely. It doesn't mean that you need to call a plumber. Evidently, the word means that you look extra cool and fancy, okay? So, teens, for those of you, the only ones in the room, and maybe a few parents that are cooler than me that knew this in advance, you don't have to get a bunch of likes on your drippy outfit of the day. That sounds ridiculous. But you know what? So does living for anybody else's approval. You don't give an account to other people. As ridiculous as it sounds for me to say that you shouldn't be living to get the likes for your drippy outfit of the day, you also shouldn't be living for the approval of others. Like, it's just as ridiculous, and yet we do it all too often. Or, we're in that position of trying to judge others and hold on to them as if we control what they should be doing in non-essential things. Let's remember that we give an account to God, not others. Which means others don't give an account to us. Now, we are to help each other, encourage one another, but that's a lot different than fighting with each other over non-essentials. This text should be a warning, but it also should be a motivation. God cares about all we do. We can honor him in all we do. And we should operate from faith, giving thanks to God in all we do. So as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 9 and 10, as I jump back into it and back and forth, let's eat, drink, and train ourselves as ones who give an account to him for all we do. And let's stop being so prone to fight and to argue with others about things that aren't critical to the gospel, that aren't sin issues, that are non-essentials. We don't report to each other, we report to Christ. Let me give you a warning, though. Those of you already reading ahead, maybe you read Romans 14 already this morning, and you see that the second half of the chapter is giving you that point that's on the screen. A little preview for next week. We don't report to others, but what we do does impact others. So I don't want to chop verse 12 and say we are islands who do not impact each other. No, in context, we impact each other. And we impact each other through our dialogue, through our discussion, through encouraging one another, but not through fighting with each other over non-essential stuff. We're going to stand, sing, we're going to respond now through song. Afterwards, I'm going to come back up and walk us through a longer announcement and a thought and implication for our church life. But I want us to respond to Christ first. If you want to talk or pray, I'll be available in the back. If you want to talk about trusting Christ as your Savior, being set free from the crippling weight of making up for your own sin and trying to appease everyone else when God has said, I offer you my approval and acceptance in Christ, that's the most important thing that you can have. I'll be available in the back. We're going to respond through song, and I hope it'll be an overflow of your heart as we turn our eyes to the Lord and what he has done for us that we might get along with each other on non-essential things. Let's stand now.
All right, so I originally put this in my sermon, but I thought better and talked through and said, hey, this is more an announcement with some implication for our church than sermon material. So I'm still going to kind of work through my script here a little bit, but also talk with you. So as a church, we're in January, which means it's that time of year that we started last year where we work on membership agreements, where we submit those. Some of you, this is, you're like, hey, this is all I've ever known at this church because you've gotten here in the last year. Others, you're like, hey, this isn't the way we did it. Whatever decade God allowed you to join our church and you've been a part of our church in. So, recognizing what we're working through in Romans 14 and 15, recognizing that we all report to the Lord. I want to explain again why we do this, and I'm also like fighting off a sneeze, which is the worst part of speaking before people. You're like, hey, am I going to sneeze? Am I not going to sneeze? Okay, I think I'm not going to sneeze now that I've talked about it, so it'll sneak up on me in a minute. Okay, so it's the time of year when we put in the membership agreements. Why do we do that? This is a new thing. It's an annual thing. I want to remind you that these actions regarding church membership are ultimately between you and the Lord. You do submit that to the church, and your signing of the membership agreement is between you and the Lord, but it says to the church body, I'm committed to the concepts found in the church agreement, the church covenant, which is something that we looked at, we've preached through, we examined again, even when we were walking through Hebrews chapter 10 in the early fall, all right? Last year, we made it an annual thing. Why did we make it an annual thing instead of a once-for-all-time thing? Because we have a tendency at the Baptist church level, Baptist churches have a tendency to accept people and then forget people. And Baptist churches around the country have hundreds upon hundreds of people that joined their church at one point and then disappeared and we forgot to follow up with. And we forgot to show them that we cared enough about them to follow up with them and continue to care for them. And we want to make a habit and a system that encourages us to follow up with people. We should be doing that more than once a year, but we're not going to sign the membership agreement like every Sunday or once a quarter or anything like that. Okay, but this helps us know who we need to follow up with. And the the membership committee did a marvelous job last year working through everyone that was originally a member of our church that had joined some in the 60s and 70s and maybe hadn't seen since the 80s and other situations. We heard great stories, some neat stuff. There was a little over a thousand members of our church that had joined at some point, and we couldn't find a lot of them. Others had become members of other places. Others we still weren't able to contact. Membership committee will shoot you out some stats report later this week in the E! News on all their work. But at this point, we've got about 250 people that are either children of members or members of the church actively involved and have a church covenant turned in last year. But you need to do it again this year. I want to encourage you, though, because this isn't just a matter of record-keeping. This is a matter of of whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of the Lord. I want to ask you to take your membership agreement home. They're available in the back. I'm going to have some students. In fact, I'll put my kids to work. Ladies, Izzy and Ada, if you'll be at the back door, giving out. All of you take a copy home, read through it, pray through it. Pray 
through because it's a matter of reporting to the Lord. Whether you sign or you don't sign, whether you turn it in next week or you take three weeks, it's a unto the Lord. It's an unto the Lord thing, and I want to ask you to pray through. You'll see a slight disagreement. It's not disagreement, slight change. Wow, disagreement's like so much in my vocabulary from this week. Slight change in the way it looks because it looks better and looks uh, more fancy, but also there's a spot here for children's signatures. Parents, we're not requiring this of children. Parents that have teenagers in your home, we're not changing the Constitution or any proposal that those under 18 can still vote. But having chatted with Pastor Jacob and chatted with Carol, we feel like that teaching our kids at an, even an early age that the church is an important thing and you ought to be committed to a church and a church ought to be committed to you can be a valuable thing. So we'd like to ask you, if you have children in your home and you plan on being a member of our church, walk through this with your kids. If they've been baptized, we would encourage them, after you guys walk through it and pray through it, to sign their name to it as well. Okay, doesn't make, we're not going to come after them and say, Jesse, you didn't sign one, why did you not? Okay, that's different. This is a matter of your discipleship and growth in your home. You praying through that, but we thought it would be a good thing for them to learn as they grow up, you should be committed to a church, reaffirming that and being involved, and know what your church believes, and that your church ought to be committed to you. Because we'd love for them to all remain here. I keep trying to convince my kids that there's this awesome school that they can go to locally in college called George Mason, and why would you ever go anywhere else other than Nova or George Mason and just stay home and live with your parents until you like live next door to them? But the reality is, many of you will move, or many of your children will end up taking jobs elsewhere, and they need to see what a Christian church ought to be like. We're not a perfect church. We're just trying to commit to Jesus and commit to each other. If you've got questions about your membership stuff, membership agreement, talk with me, talk with a member of the membership committee, talk with one of our pastors. It's January, so I'd ask you, do not, by the way, do not grab one and sign it today and turn it in today. We are not accepting them today because it means that you have not followed my instructions. I am the fiat for a minute. You must take it home and pray before, or at least take it to your car and pray before you turn it in, okay? Take it to your vehicle, pray, turn it back in starting next week, okay? I believe Pastor Ron has an announcement, or did you have Jacob doing that? Okay. Um, Randy and uh, uh, Becky Crothers and Don Pettit and Susan Willis make our, allow our seniors to, to know about everything that's going on, and they, we really appreciate that. But we have an event planned a week from tomorrow that has a broader interest than just seniors. Uh, there's a quartet that's going to come. We're going to have a sing-along uh, type of concert on, at noon on a Monday. It's Martin Luther King Day. Hopefully some of the work schedules will be different, and you might be able to participate Thank with us. Right. We'll be happy to serve you a lunch, and then we'll have a sing-along concert. This quartet... Actually, my wife and I attended a, uh, a quartet concert recently, and this quartet was the warm-up group for the main group. And as we left that night, we said, you know what, the warm-up group was better than the main group. <laughs> and uh, so I got to know them, and, uh, and we've invited them, and they're coming, and I'm uh, excited. This is the Gaither-type music, Southern Gospel-type music, if you like that harmony and that quartet. We invite you to come along. We have room for more than 100 people. We have 40 or 50 coming now, but uh, you're welcome to come. Invite anybody that you want, and we'll have a good time together. I don't have any announcements myself. I'm, myself, I'm more of fac facilitating uh, announcements, so I'll have Cindy come up real quick. Oh. Okay, we have another announcement by yes, Jason. There we go. This is what happens when I get off my manuscript, when I plan to go for my manuscript. If you are not, have never joined our church, you need to look at the membership agreement, but I would love to sit down and talk with you, one of our pastors talk with you and hear your testimony, your story of faith, and we'd welcome you to join our church, see what we're about, talk about expectations with us. So, Cindy, you're now free to come up. I will remain in the back unless I exercise my pastoral prerogative to come forward again. <laughs> Good morning again, church. Um, this is just, again, another plug for the Live Fully Women's Conference that will be held on March 11th, and it's going to be at the First Baptist Church of Alexandria, um, of course in Alexandria. Um, I put additional flyers on the back table that look like this. You've seen it now since October. But I also wanted to remind you that there are only three weeks left for the $43 uh, kickoff rate. 
and there are two ways of securing that. Um, in order to secure that promotional rate, um, I pre-purchased 10 tickets for the conference. There are seven left. I left a sign-up sheet on the back table. If you're interested in attending, you can certainly put your name, your contact information for me, and I will contact you when we can, um, we can go ahead and purchase it that way. Otherwise, you can uh, certainly go to the website and then sign up there. On the flyers out back, you're going to see that I noted that, um, that promotional code. So if you choose to not um, put your name on that sign-up sheet, you can go online, use that code, and that's another way of um, getting that $43 promotional rate. But that's it. Any questions? I know that you're going to be completely blessed by this. We have a great lineup of speakers there organized by North Star, um, lunches included. So sign up. Thank you. And just a quick announcement about the Ladies Bible Study. We will be starting a new topic this week uh, on Tuesday and Thursday, or Friday, Tuesday evenings and Friday mornings. We will be doing the study of Ruth. Uh, there's also another study that will be only on Friday mornings that will be the Love Dare for Parents. Uh, and there are some signups in the back for that. But especially if you want to come on Tuesday evenings, that will be by Zoom. So we need to get out the email with the Zoom link. So make sure we have your email uh, so we're able to get that out to you. It will start this week. It was wrong in the e-news, not next week. It's starting this week. So let us know if you want that email link on Tuesday nights. All right. I will say a few other announcements before we uh, end in prayer. Uh, I just want to also repeat what Pastor Jason had mentioned last week uh, about just the men's ministry. And if you want to be involved in just a small group of guys to be able to pray regularly with them, um, just to talk about um, your lives, but then also to study a book, potentially they, these groups could look unique based on each group. Um, email Pastor Jason or myself and we could get you involved in that. You get to see on the back of the bulletin, it's called Men's Action Group. Uh, that title really came from what we started during COVID when we started the action groups, if you guys remember that. Um, I'm actually still part of my action group that we've been meeting weekly um, since then. And it's just been a great time for us to be able to um, pray, regularly meet, and just talk about um, theology. We're working through a theology book together. So uh, just be thinking through that, praying through that. Um, and then also just the Wednesday night activities. Again, that's starting up this Wednesday. I'm really excited about that. We'll be going through church history. So if you like history and you want to know just the history of the church, um, I invite you, invite you to join us. And we'll be starting up Wednesday night meals then as well, like we did last semester. So let me pr uh, close this out in prayer. I think that'll be it for announcements. Lord, we love you and we praise you for who you are, Lord. We thank you for all the blessings that you have given us, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, and uh, the salvation we receive through him alone, Lord. Lord, we thank you that it's this gospel message that unites us together, Lord, into your family, Lord, that we have all been adopted. For those who have put their faith in Christ alone, Lord, we have been adopted into your family, Lord, and you have united us uh, to your son, Lord, and then naturally then to each other as well, Lord. And I pray that we will regularly act out this union uh, that we have with each other, Lord, that we will represent you well, Lord, in this world. Lord, I pray that as we go out uh, this week that we will glorify you, Lord, with what we say and do. I pray these things in your name. Amen.
Church is about people connecting with Jesus. It's about having faith in God and finding a place to belong while becoming more like Jesus. But is it possible to lose our focus? Has church become more about the building or the music or even the way we dress? Are we focusing on what matters most? And that begs the question, what's church all about? What is really important? Oh, yeah, people connecting with Jesus, church people.